John. Angie. What does a typical coaching day look like for you? Oh, I'm glad you asked me that. Normally, I like to roll out of bed at five and head to my office. 5 a.m.? No. Oh, Lord. I'm worried about what's going to come next. Typically, I work for an hour or so on some calls and then I'm about ready for dinner in bed. How do you make any money? Money? Oh, John. Let's start the show. This is The Coaching Clinic, the show that helps coaches master the art and business of coaching. From starting to scaling and from the novice to nailing it. My name is John Ball. And I'm Angela Bezignano. And our mission is to help you, the self-employed coach, to grow your business and master the art of coaching. So you can have a thriving and profitable coaching practice. So, obviously today we're going to talk about, which I think is super important, what does a typical day look like for a coach? Mm. How do you structure your day as a self-employed coach. I think it's especially important to to make the distinction of this may look very different for those who are fully self-employed with their own coaching business to those Mm. who may be employed on contract to someone else and maybe just getting clients sent through. Uh, But yeah, I think we'll still be able to give you a pretty good insight into some of the good and bad practices (laughs) that can go along with these kinds of days. And especially for those who do have their own coaching practice, How to make sure that you're doing the right things that are going to get your results and not the wrong things that are going to take you off track or delay you or slow you down. Stuff that I've certainly done. I don't know about you, Angie, but I've done a lot of the Um, wrong things before I got to the right things. I think I did a lot of busy things before I got to the, uh, you know, the impactful things, right? The actions of the day, the habits of the day. And Mm -hmm. I have to be honest, a lot of that wasn't just business oriented, right? There were some habits that I needed to really put into play, but we'll talk more about that because it didn't happen. My first focus was, what do I need to do as a coach? Mm -hmm. What do I do? I'm like sitting at the desk going, woo, look at this. I'm working for me today. That was fun and new. And a huge learning curve. I mean, it did not yeah. happen overnight for me. No, likewise. One of the things I think, I, I was missing something really basic when I was first yeah. getting started that took me a while to figure out. I, in fact, to be told, essentially, I was told by a coaching marketing expert to sort this out, which was office hours. I actually uh, didn't uh, set office hours for myself. And, and it, it seems so obvious, right? I kind of thought, I'll work with myself. I just work whenever I need to. And But not having those specific office hours actually caused a lot of issues. And I think that probably the thing that resolved it most quickly was setting up my calendar <laughs> because I needed to have that calendar for people to book in. It's like, okay, when do I actually want to be available to people for coaching? And when do I need time for other things, projects and other business elements that I'm working on? And that started to help get it sorted. But how about you? Absolutely. I think I was maybe a step ahead because I've always been a planner. I've literally had a planner since I was 19. I still have the same kind of planner, although I do utilize, obviously, like I'll use a calendar and all the things, but I still have an ink and paper calendar because, you know what, if something happens, I have it. I know what I'm doing. I know people are laughing. Don't laugh. It's gotten me out of trouble many times, but because I've naturally been a planner, I think that was not as big a challenge for me as it might have been for you. But what I put into that calendar, I was, again, pretty young. And I was like, anything to keep me busy. It's like I needed to fill the day and the time and felt really, I I can remember the feeling too. I can remember feeling, gosh, I got so much done today. No client. Mm. (laughs) Got so much done today. No client. And then at some point, months probably into it, I was like, okay, what the hell am I doing? Like, what am I really doing? And Mm. I don't feel like I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing because I've been training people in sales for years. And one of the first things that I do with them is put a calendar together, make effective plans and goals around the plan, or I should say goals and then plans around the goals and the thing. The light bulb finally went off. I was like, I'm still selling myself right now. And I wasn't doing that. So that was the big indicator for me that I was like, oh, 
wait, busy doing task work, busy work. I call them, don't laugh, I call them nippas, not nipples, nippas, non-income producing activities. Mm -hmm. They're necessary. Nipples is more memorable, but uh, yeah, nippas. Well, you won't forget now, right? <laughs> and they were just saying, but it's the truth. Like I really was, I had to differentiate first and foremost, before I even started putting the calendar together, what were the necessary things that I needed to do administratively? Those were the mm. non-income producing activities, putting together a website and things that I wanted to do. But yeah. what were the things that were actually going to potentially lead to an income? Oh, lead. Oh, lead generation. Oh. So then again, had that big moment and then had to decide what to do with that. Yeah. Yeah. I found that employing the use of a productivity planner, uh -huh. which for me has take, mainly taken the form of rich ones. I like a bit of old school writing things down by hand. So using a productivity planner, and I've tried a few and some are certainly better than others, was giving me more clarity on what needed to be done on a day-to-day -day basis. It was also showing me what I was actually doing. What am I spending my time on? Am I seeing the results from that? Am I feeling productive or not? What do I do to turn things up? What do I do? What, sh what action should I be taking? Planning my week ahead. That was transformative. And I've even found that I've recommended that to my type A kind of clients in the past mm -hmm. who, have, who are the overachievers because very often they need that to be able to see just how much they're doing because they do so much and plan put so many things into their days and achievements that they actually lose track and don't feel that they just still don't feel that they're doing enough and you know i've had reports back from people clients who i've recommended to do that with that they found that on both ends of the spectrum those who aren't getting enough done and those who are doing way too much have both found it very helpful to be able to get more of a grip on what should and should not be happening but being able to know what your most important activity is for the day or what the additional two or three, what's two or three that would be the next most important and what's some fourth and fifth that might also be, if you have the time, good to get to. That's really valuable. But even with that, I don't think I had the full picture until one of my business mentors showed me pretty much a roadmap for building and growing the business and the roadmap of different income levels where I was able to recognize that a lot of the activities I was doing were way ahead of the level I was at. And a lot of the foundational elements for building the business on were missing. Yeah. That was a big yeah. wake up call. Yeah. And I think so for, the, for everybody listening, obviously, I think we're making it pretty clear. The first thing you have to decide is what tool is going to work best for you. Right. Mm -hmm. So if John and I are talking old school and it's, you know, I don't use ink and paper. I started out with ink and paper and realized quickly that it started to look like a Christmas tree exploded on the page. So I started using mechanical pencil and I can erase and it's much better for me. But listen, if I'm talking, if we're talking to a 30 year old right now who's getting into coaching, you and I both know they're not. There are so many tools out there for you to choose from in terms of keeping yourself structured, find something that works for you. Because if you don't like it, if you don't like it, it is not going to work for you. So when somebody suggested to me that I go full on, use my Google Calendar for all things all day, every day, I hated it. I absolutely hated it. Do I use it? Of course I use it because I have appointments now and automations in place. But Everything I do still goes into this calendar for me. So yeah. it works. I have to, so, you know, 35 years later, I'm still doing the same thing as I did because it really does work. So that's the first thing. And then I think then you have to decide, again, best habit when we've talked about this, like figuring out your goals, right? Is it monetary? Is it based on how many clients you want to work with and how you're structuring your business as a coach? And that's going to dictate what you end up doing every day. So if you're sitting here and I, I don't recommend waiting until January 1st, because what you're going to be doing for the following year, you know, you should be planning in fourth quarter of the year you're in. Tenth, we're in third, we're coming up on fourth pretty quickly. So what are the goals that you have for a year? What are the big goals? Three years. 
And you need to, you've probably heard this, begin with the end in mind so that you know what it is you need to, you will be able to back that all the way up to what you do every single day. How many people mm-hmm. you need to contact? All those things. John's got this smile on his face. You can't see it, but no, it's probably it's like. That, really just that thing of uh, the cliche of failing to plan is planning to fail, right? And it's, it's so yeah. true. It's a cliche for a reason, but planning makes all the difference. We, I think we've talked in various episodes in various situations about the importance of planning and preparation. And this is one of those critical things as well. The reality of a coaching business today, though, is that it's not just show up and coach. It is all the other things, the foundational things I was going to talk about, the stuff that actually gets you clients through the proverbial door and business on a regular basis. So it's having those things like, when are you going to spend some time on your marketing? When are you going to spend some time on your social media? When are you going to spend some time maybe doing some networking or podcast interviews or whatever else it is you're doing for your business, that stuff has to be planned into your days as well as your coaching sessions and really can't be pick a mix to the extent of I'll just do it when I've got a gap here. <laughs> I'll do it when I've got a gap Absolutely. There. Because we don't work that way. In fact, it's been demonstrated time and time again that the simple act of task switching takes a significant cognitive load for us, which means it's hard. It means it makes us more tired. It means that makes the things that we're going to go on and do more difficult. And so if we want to make life a bit easier for ourselves, we need to segment our time for working on them and give ourselves the ability to do prospecting, to be able to do interaction, to be able to do networking, whatever else we're going to be doing or need to be doing to be growing and developing our business to have time to follow up with your clients, time to look after yourself as a self-care, all of these things that need to happen to have success for you and your business. They're so I essential. Say, it can't be left absolutely. to chance. Absolutely. Yeah, no. And I think that the administrative side of what we do is why we are able to do what we do, right? You have to set it up. You have to fill the space, so to speak, and be able to attract people. But there's also some things, too, that I think are really important. This was a big shift for me was learning to stay off social media and email because I was able to just pick up the phone and go, did I get any emails? Did I get any responses? Let me check my socials. Let me check everything. But before I, three seconds after I opened my eyes, right? That was how I wouldn't say obsessed, but how I would start my day. And it was a lousy way to start my day. It derailed me. It literally would derail the plan that I or the structure that I put into place because I was like, oh, I didn't even change out of my bed clothes yet. And I was like starting my work day at 4.35, 5.30 in the morning. That wasn't the plan. And the problem with it was that it sent me into, let me just answer these five emails. Let me just do this Mm -hmm. really quick and then I'll do that. It totally derailed the plan. So that was a bad habit. And I'm gonna say this to everybody listening. It is so easy to want to pick up that phone. I don't know anybody who doesn't go to sleep with their phone next to their bed. Honestly, I don't. It's the truth. And I used to use the excuse of I need to have it on in case my parents have an emergency. If they have an emergency, there's always 911 because it just didn't make sense. And it would actually cost me. And I did this, by the way. I did do the measurement. It was costing me about five hours a day. That's 25 hours a week. And then what happened was, because I wasn't getting the work that I needed to get done in the time that I planned on completing it, my days would then go until 7, 8, 9, 10 o'clock at night. And my husband would be like, hello, are you here? Because I'd start business and then do things all day and then do personal and then come back to finish. If I even did finish. If I even Mm. did finish, bad habit, slap on the wrist. That is just a really poor habit, which true. But easy to do. And and that's a lack of planning, really, right? Isn't it? It relates very much to what we're talking about. It's just you roll into it. Most people probably do start their day off checking their phone and maybe even opening their emails, which I I, I will not open an email like 
Um, I, I actually, I'm, I'm one of those annoying people, perhaps annoying, who has my phone nearly always set to silent. So it doesn't even vibrate when I get messages. So unless I'm expecting a call urgent that I need to have an alert for, my phone's always on silent because I don't need to be that person who's like immediate response. And those times when I do need to be directly available, I am, but they're rare. They're not all the time. And most of us find ourselves being 24 seven directly available. I can't bear people leaving their phone alerts or vibrate on through the night. I think that's the must disturb their sleep so much and, and I just can't do it. Yeah. I won't check an email. I will briefly check who's sent, maybe a WhatsApp or something like that, just to see if there's any messages from family in case or anything it's me. like that. In <laughs> case it's you, <laughs> of course. <laughs> but, you know, that kind of is it because then the first thing I'm going to use my mobile phone for in the morning is doing my daily Wordle. That, that's like the first thing, cup of I coffee, love my daily Wordle. Wordle. It keeps your brain fresh. Keeps your brain fresh. But so here's the thing, though, here to what you're saying and to your point is that, you know what, you have to set parameters for yourself because what that will also do is it will also teach people when you're available, right? I have had this go through my life where people are like, you're working from home or you work for yourself. Why are you answering your phone? Literally leaving me five, six voicemails going, where are you? Why aren't you answering your phone? Um, because I am still working. So these are parameters. These are boundaries that you need to set for yourself that will then transfer to the people around you so Mm. that they know. I actually have a friend, he calls it digital sunset. I'll probably send this one to him and say, hey, talked about you today. But literally the phone goes off at a specific time for him and there is no further conversation. So if I send him a message at 59 minutes past the hour, that is not getting answered until the next day. And I really feel like that's an amazing, very ritualistic in its, you know, in its way. But we need to do that, right? We need to protect ourselves and our time. And if you start the day with the holy crap, oh my gosh, even if it's good, even if somebody says, oh my gosh, I can't wait to work with you. I read your proposal. I'm ready to go. We feel compelled to run to that and go, that's an exception. You have to decide if there are exceptions because, again, what does that even look like? I will check the phone, make sure that I didn't hear from somebody. My daddy lives alone. I definitely do that. And the habit is to go put the phone down in my office after that to charge so that I can do my day, right? My my self-care, how I prepare for the day. Things that are important, I can no longer, and I should probably have never done this, but just get up, shower, and like now I'm sitting at work. I'm sitting at my desk and I'm at work. Yeah, I had to incorporate some things into that. The work starts before the work, right? Yeah. It's, or it should, it should do anyway. And that can be making sure you get a good night's sleep, making sure you're well rested. It can be having your morning routine that sets you up for the day. Mm-hmm. But your morning routine is not your work. Your morning routine is your self-care this is the you time where you maybe want to do some movement thinking some meditation whatever you whatever sets you up best for starting your day those are the kinds of things that do for me for sure how about you what's that what are the things that set you up for a great day listen i really have to be outside like i literally get up i'm literally up i drink some water i'm usually a cup 16 or so ounces I let my body wake up a little bit because I used to be hit the ground running. Now I hit the ground and lip skid, right? I don't want to do that anymore. I don't want to do that. I want to wake up gently and I always start with gratitude. Before I even get out of the bed, I always start with gratitude like, hey, I'm awake another day. Hey, two-time cancer survivor. I better be thanking somebody for something. And I am. And I'm like, it's a great day. I purposely keep the shades open in my bedroom because the sun comes up on that side of the house. And I just, I want that. I don't want it to be dark. I want to wake up and see the sky. And that starts to light me up, literally. So when by the time I get out of the bed, I don't rush into the shower. I will go down. I will make myself a cup of coffee. And I go outside and I'm listening because it's early. And I might do some more gratitude because I feel like I just need more of that. And I already know, by the way, right, what I'm doing on a Monday 
or Tuesday or Wednesday, like I plan my weeks probably about a month in advance. And then every Friday when I'm done with work, I literally, before I shut everything down, I make sure that the following week is still what it was and I've made the adjustments so that when I come to Sunday night and I'm preparing for that work week, everything is okay. Just a quick reminder, what do I have this week? What, what's going mm. on this week that I need to be like hyper aware of? This way I don't have to worry. It is not clogging my brain up with worry. By, and I don't get the Sunday night scaries where it's about. Ah, it's tomorrow already. It's Monday. No, I'm ready to go into my, I know what Sunday night, I know what I'm doing on Monday. I know what, like, I know what's happening, what the expectation yeah. of the day. I don't come to my desk, open up a planner about, oh no, I didn't know I had that today. I should have started that two hours ago. No, yeah. I am fully prepared and ready. And that doesn't mean that I don't mess up though. Yeah, we all have our little mess ups. I am uh, maybe a little, maybe call it a little more slapdash. I don't know. But I mean, I generally know what's going to be in my week. And mm -hmm. I also know that anything that is, absolutely has to happen needs to be on my calendar. Because otherwise it doesn't happen. That's just a reality for me. And I've learned to become the kind of person who relies on an organizer and mm -hmm. myself to be organized. Because I know how much of a difference it makes. So those things are all beneficial. I would love to get to being a bit more month in advance. I mean, there are elements of my calendar that I will plan a month or even months in advance, but day-to-day -day planning tends to happen on a weekly basis for me. I plan the week out, maybe have uh, um, uh, some moments of reflection <laughs> towards the end of the week as to how the week has gone and what maybe went, what didn't go so well, what might be, where there might be room for improvement. I like to think about those things. I do very much find, I, I mean, I always want to come back to the gratitude stuff. I've talked about gratitude in a number of places uh, and how important it is to me because I do feel like that practice saves me to some degree. I often say it saves my life. That might be a little hyperbolic, but it certainly saved me in many ways from myself and from falling into the darkest pits of despair and anguish and whatever else that oh. may have been coming up at certain points in my life. And it was being challenged by a, a coach friend of mine to implement that practice that whilst it took it probably took several weeks before I started to really feel anything coming from it, I did start to realize that my attitude was changing, that I was appreciating things more, that I was generally feeling happier mm. during my day. That I got to a point of like where we worked together and we kept increasing that. I was finding at least five things a day to be grateful for at that point. And uh, after having built up from just one, which I struggled with in the first week, I struggled with finding one yeah. thing a day to be grateful for because my brain wasn't tuning into that. It was transformative, completely transformative to the point where I, I used to, I definitely have been someone who struggled in my life with things like enthusiasm and motivation. And this gratitude practice started to change all of that as well. I found myself getting excited about things, being more enthusiastic yeah. in my interactions with people because I was appreciating my life more. The thing of what you appreciate appreciates, right? That I was sure. very much feeling that in my life. And gratitude was really the heart of that. So I do think that gratitude piece is hugely important. We could probably even have a whole episode dedicated to that at some point in the future. I, I will add it oh, to no, our list to come I think that we to. should, because I think that people underestimate gratitude. And I think there are just, there are some practices that are more superficial than others. And I've always said to people like your bank, you just referenced it, which made it jump into my head. You can't expect your bank account to grow unless you're making deposits. If you're constantly taking out and extracting. So if you are using your energy like an ATM and you're constantly just pulling out and you don't replenish what's in there, eventually, guess what? You're going to get the big fat, sorry, there's nothing left. You're in trouble closing the account. If like it's not good for you. So definitely yeah, yeah. having some real practices in place. And I think part of that too is like, when you're organizing and you're, we can talk about productivity and, and time blocking and things like that, because I am very strategic. Nothing in my calendar happens at a certain time by accident. Not one thing. I have time every day for discovery calls that I, I am very, again, strategic about. I am very structured in when I am doing sessions, right? Everybody's, don't you just accommodate? I'd love to be able to just accommodate, but I work with people all over the world. I can't, yeah. right? I have to stay true to 
even my own time zone for me at this point. So lead generation every single day. And and when I say that, of course, that's another whole conversation, but because of how you might do that, what are the tools that you're using for that? But all of that goes into my week, without a doubt. Mm. But one of the things that I had to learn and didn't come until later was flex time. I used to really account for every minute of what I deemed my work day, right? I chose when I started to work and I chose, by the way, when I ended work, what was that this day or these days, I'm, this is a hard stop for me. There isn't a five or a 15 or a 20 because again, into the rabbit hole we go. So it was really important for me to structure it in such a way that it made sense, but allowing buffer times because mm -hmm. as we all know, Life just doesn't happen on the terms that we think it's going to. So I don't know, let's just say in the midst of the day, I incorporate in a personal appointment that's maybe virtual, right? Or, and I allow for a couple of hours and then that person's running late or I hit traffic or something just happens, right? It just always does. I need to have that flex time because what would happen for me is, and lots of stress building upon yeah. stress because my days were so structured and back to back. I was overloading myself and that was causing me to become, I wouldn't say the word is like unreliable, but you know, coaches that, for example, do back to back coaching calls. I don't do it. I cannot do it. I am not good at that. I don't thrive in that. And what happens is two, even if it's one minute late to the next call because my bladder is about to explode that to me is not fair to that one because it just ever be in the I'm, ever like, the doctor and they're like sorry doctor's like two hours behind what i'm like if i wasn't like, sitting here dying right now i'd be really angry but we don't want to be that we if you allow for that flex it makes for a much calmer and yeah. usually a much more fluid kind of a day, just a, gr a better know, day. You know how a lot of people now have these like treadmill desks and things yeah. like that of you? Yeah, how they do. I don't know either. But nice idea, right? <laughs> I know people who have it for sure. But I think maybe we need to bring in the um, commode seats for business professionals <laughs> so we can do those back-to-back -back coaching sessions without having to get up and go to the toilet. I and mean, that could be that could be a whole industry right there. It's like you want to work solid today, you want to get your hustle on without taking breaks. Here we go. Here's uh, the office seat for you. You are definitely not speaking my language. <laughs> no, I, I wouldn't do it anyway. I wouldn't do it anyway. But but that's I would need that if I was going to do back to back coaching today. sessions is all. Well, you I know would what definitely that want that. That's another, but that brings up another point. Years ago, I worked for um, a coaching company and I learned a really great practice. And it's funny because I'm not one that like meditates per se in like the traditional sense. There are things that I will do that actually bring me peace, whether it's like going to a lake or going into the forest, which I can't do a forest here in Arizona where I live, not close by, but even if it's like a, just a walk up into the mountains by myself so that I can just reconnect with like nature. And I'm not Mrs. Kumbaya. I'm just saying like getting away from it all and having that place to go to get away from it all and to turn everything yeah. off. But what I did learn, and I have no problem sharing this, is if you just, you can even Google it. It's called the release meditation technique. And I wouldn't say that I was like poo-pooing it. It was just new to me. But I will say to you that once I learned that, because it's about a two minute, two and a half minute from start to finish, I can't, I have to do that in between my sessions. That is worked into my day. So I hmm. probably do it five or six times a day. And one of the, and I do it when I get up because I want to, anytime I want to shift my energy, cleanse the palate. We've talked about it. You've heard me talk about it, but that is something that is a start to my day. And it also is an end. It's not just something that I utilize in between sessions to cleanse my emotional palate. As I said last time, 
it's definitely a great way for me to decompress, disconnect in the moment so that I'm not carrying like energy builds up during the course of the day. Right. So yeah. this allows me to empty that as the day progresses. That's huge for me. That's like the self. Yeah, and if you had your commode office chair, you could have Here a big go. shift whenever you want. Sky today. <laughs> I don't even know what to say. I'm not apologizing because it's why I love them. But geez, Louise. Um, <laughs> let me ask you. Let me ask yeah. you. I want to bring it back to serious stuff because my brain likes to go for the gutter most of the time. But let's, ri the ri gutter. let's rise, try and rise above gutter level. And um, do you find that there are best practices for you in how you start your working day? Not your day at home, like not how you start your day, but your working day and how you close that off. I mean... Maybe the release meditation is part of how you close that off as well. It is absolutely how I shift my energy from whatever's going on in the household. And it, like I said, it could be great. It could be good. Maybe it's not so good, right? Maybe it's not a good day in, in the UNG household. Maybe, whatever. But whatever it is, I want to come in, close the door. And I do that meditation so that I can literally shift into what I'm doing today. It doesn't take me 25 minutes to get mentally, I think it's changed now for adults too. I'd have to really look it up, but how long it takes for us to focus when in between and when there's distractions and things. So I, yeah. I utilize that, but I pretty much at that point, I've also prioritized the day. So there's certain things that I'm doing at certain times on certain days for a reason whether it's lead generating or it's follow-up or it's even creating new content. I give myself time every day because something comes up every day and I'm like, ooh, that's a great piece I'm going to do a video on. So mm. enough structure for me, it's having just the right amount of structure so that I'm getting things done. And we talked about this, like staying on task that's not easy. That's not easy. How do you do that? That's really important. But also yeah. still having fun in my practice, because if I'm just sitting here grinding every day, I wouldn't still be a coach. There would be no possibility of that happening. Yeah. Yeah. And I think my day, my work day, generally starts about, I have to see the overview of the day. If I have clients early in the day, I'm going to be looking at notes and preparing for those sessions in my head at least before we go on to those and mm -hmm. um, perhaps even bringing up their profiles in my CRM and you know, I just want to be set for the day now I also want to see where I've got gaps and I also want to see where I've got where I've got stuff planned in to do specific activities and one of the things that helped me with that was a book called Deep Work by Cal Newport and that really was about given getting that developing that ability like we train our bodies in the gym well some of us do I've, I've been known to from time to time but training ourselves in that kind of way to be able to work for longer periods on specific tasks to go deep with it because not about you but most of us even even now i still find myself with the, the temptation is always to oh well, i wonder what's going on social media or things like that to be distracted there's so many <laughs> things that can distract us from stuff that Developing that ability to work on a specific task or a project for an hour, two hours, pr probably hard to go more than that on one thing, really, without having some kind of significant break. But it's a skill that we can develop uh, and is really useful to do so because it's hard to come by these days. A lot of us are so scattered and distracted. And their social media is a big culprit for the distractions. Mm -hmm. In fact, the, I think it's really good to get to that because. A lot of us need social media for growing our business and for business development and client uh, interaction and attraction and stuff. But many of us are still using social media mostly to, to be a participant rather than to be a, a creator. Uh, and we need to move more into the creator mindset, whereas we're not a user, we're more of a creator. If it's, if, and this is what, something you can track. And I don't say this to berate anybody because I've been, I'm as guilty of it as anyone else, but the more we can be on social media as a creator, we should track our time and see what, where, where are we spending our social media time? Like, I don't care about how much screen time you have if you're using it in ways that are going to be beneficial and constructive. But if you're just sure. doom scrolling, if you're just doom scrolling Twitter or X or whatever, 
that is not a productive use of your time and probably isn't making you feel great either. And you're not actually creating or contributing or doing anything good for yourself. So again, it can be those busy things, but social media can be a, one of those things, oh, I'm just on social media. I need to be on social media for my work. But yeah, but are you actually doing work stuff on social media? or you know looking at facebook memories or whatever else absolutely and you know what here's the thing and i know i've said this and it's something that i stand by you have to we have to as a coach you need to adopt the mindset that you're the ceo and mm. you cannot behave differently because you are and i don't care if you work remotely at home right if your office is at home or if you're like in some space we actually have an office like you do john you go to an office to go to work so yeah. your time is still your own and you need to use it in a in a very specific way. And you have to stay on top of yourself and say, would I be doing this if I had a five hundred thousand dollar a year job and somebody I had to answer to a board of directors or whomever? Right. Would I be yeah. doing this? Because if I wouldn't, then I sh if I wouldn't do it, then I shouldn't be doing it now. The other thing I wanted to mention earlier, it's all about mindset, right? I'm talking about those things, right? Is the idea that there is no MD at the end of your last name. You're not on call. There is no emergency. That's really a great way to say to yourself or allow yourself to disconnect, right? And only connect when it is when you have um, planned for it. And I think that th those things will keep you, keep yourself honest. This is your business. If you don't do the work that's necessary, and that doesn't mean that you're always going to have it dialed in and you're not going to, because listen to John and I, we've screwed up. You know, we, we thought just showing up to the desk, somebody was going to magically, the phone was going to ring and somebody was going to want to hire us. Obviously, haha, that's an exaggeration, but we had to learn the hard way and it cost us time. It cost us money. And now that we've both been doing this for so long, collectively over 50 years. Are we perfect? No, we're still learning, but we definitely got some really core um, habits and practices and systems in place that yeah. allow us to do what we're doing here today, right? Being able to say, gosh, where was this when I was took it just wasn't there, what didn't exist. And you really do have to decide on the systems, what the habits are going to be. What are the things that are going to fill you up? What are the things that are going to benefit your business? And give yourself the time. Put it into a planner. Make the plan. Do the plan. Check it out. Is it working? Is it not? What is it working? What needs to change and how? That's a business. Yeah. It's really good idea to categorize the things that are on your activity list. In fact, I was thinking this whole thing of, it's been on my mind this week, actually. As, as a self-employed person, mm -hmm. you're your boss and you are the boss and you're the employee. You're, you're mm -hmm. both of those things. And right. so we need to sometimes put on the separate hats for each of those. Mm -hmm. And as an employee, you should have, you know, maybe as put on, your, put on your boss hat, your CEO, CEO hat, and write a job description for your employee. And yeah. then... Put on your employee hat and look at your job description and look at your week and look at what needs to happen when in relation to that. And then prioritize on what absolutely needs to happen, whether yeah. that's today or on a weekly basis, what absolutely needs to happen to get you to your objectives. What is good to happen that isn't such a priority, but would be good if you can get that done as well. Mm -hmm. And what really doesn't need to be happening or what do you absolutely need to stay away from? Yeah. In order to get in order to get your results. I think it's really useful to go through that level of prioritization and maybe even get eyes on that from someone else if you need a bit of external input to guide you as to what you should and shouldn't be spending some time on in your professional weeks, because it's very easy to get this wrong and feel like you're being busy and like I'm working so hard and doing all this. And why aren't I seeing results? I've been there, you've been there. It's not good. Well, I think that, first of all, like anybody who is listening should even consider the idea of hiring a coach. You don't always have to wait for something to not be working. Maybe you mm -hmm. hire somebody out of the gate to say, I have some budget for this, and maybe you don't. But if you do, if you can find it, what it will save you in time would probably be worth it, right, to make the expenditure happen. I think that's important. I think it's really important to be able to 
I, this is a great practice. I mentioned part of it earlier is at the end of the week, really evaluating what went well. Like I always say, what were my best um, sessions this week? What can I do more of? How did I do that? And then I might look at it and say, okay, what were the challenging sessions this week? And what can I do better? What do I need to work on to do better? I always do that self-check, but you can do the same in the structure of your business. I still do that. And there are weeks when even at this stage, I could look at the week and go, er, you know what? I really didn't do enough lead generating. I didn't follow up enough. Yes, I have systems in place that handle the majority of certain things for me, but what they don't handle is the human interaction piece. So you do have to look at yourself. I would say weekly, look at your structure. What worked? What did I do? What went on as planned? And what didn't and why? What was the distraction? Did something different happen? Was there a different necessity? Yeah. Evaluate. I'd say Stay daily, aware. actually. I'd, I'd say daily. I think it's a good check-in for yourself each day as to what went well today, what didn't go so well. Uh -huh. And what is something that I could work on improving tomorrow to make tomorrow better than today? Yeah. Listen, and that definitely might work for people who, what for me, you know what, I've I'm, I'm been doing it this way for so long. What's interesting is if I have a crappy day, then I'm all like sitting there in self-reflection mode for hours mm -hmm. going, okay, what happened? What needed to change? What didn't I do? What did I do? How can I make that better? So sometimes in that every day, it's depending on the moment, but, but find your flow, find what works for you. If the fire starts burning on Monday, you don't want to wait until Friday to put it out. <laughs> you know what no, I mean? You do not. So really, you, t you do have to give your, again, I, we talk about this so much, right? Is take that bird's eye view of your business, your day, your activities, and really be honest. If you were writing down everything you did, I do this with clients. When they say to me, I don't have any time left, nothing. I say, okay. I want you to do this three days. I don't ask for an entire week. I say three days. I want you to literally write down every single thing you do. I don't care if you take a 10 minute body break. I don't care what that is. I literally, from the minute you wake up, I want to know what you do and how long you do it for. It's three days. It is intensive. It's annoying to them. It's like, I can't do that. Just do it. Because if you say you can't, I say, show me your calendar. Right. Not what you planned. I want to know what you're actually doing every day. And it literally turns out to be like counting calories. Right. I don't eat much. OK, but if you're eating only three slices of pizza and each one of them is 850 calories, that might be part of the problem. Right. So right. when I do that with clients, they are. And I don't think it's I don't think I've missed once. It's. Oh. OK, I didn't. And that's yeah. fine. We're not here to make you, this isn't bad. This is <laughs> awareness of what you're doing with your time. Yeah. I've seen similar things with clients I work with on their finances as well. And when they get to tr track that, they have, I'll very often have some big realizations. Mm -hmm. Tracking is a really useful tool. Like. Like one, one that should be employed. <laughs> no, I did think earlier on that it might be a really good idea to talk about what an ideal day for us would look like. But I just think it's going to be so different for everyone. Right. I think really just talking about some of the best practices, things to avoid, uh, what we do, what we've uh -huh. learned, the mistakes we made, probably is plenty <laughs> to be no, getting on with. This, though. Here's the launching thing. Be intentional about what you're mm. doing. Don't let the day just happen and start looking for things to do. Be intentional, plan it out, and learn how you fit into the structure you created. And if it's not working and it feels wonky, it just needs to be adjusted. That's yeah. what you have to think about. Do you have a favorite planning tool? I don't. I literally, listen, you're going to laugh. My my little planner is like got sunflowers on it. I bought it at Walmart for 15 bucks. That's my favorite planner. Yeah. Like it's the one that I can sit with and look at and the writing does something for me, writing it down. I have a, a method. If I erase something, I have to replace it someplace if it's important. I have a whole system. I have a whole system. I've had a productivity planner from a company called Intelligent Change. You do uh -huh. the five minute journal as well. I find that very good. I'm currently using a Panda Planner, which I like as well, which was recommended to me. So there's some really nice pa planners out there. If you're looking for a tool like that, I, I recommend getting one, try it out. And uh, it will undoubtedly help you with your productivity. 
Yeah. There's people who are very religious and whatnot, and there are planners that incorporate those types of things into it. So if that is something that matters to you, then maybe that's a better planner for you. But yeah, yeah. literally, if you Google types of planners, all of these come up. Maybe not the Walmart oh, one. Abs absolutely. Anyway. Pick one that you think looks good for you. Yeah. That's pretty much it for us for this week. We do have an exciting announcement coming soon. We'll give you a clue. It is going to involve um, seeing us in real time. That's, is that a clue or is that just giving it away? But we'll let you know more about that as and when it comes. <laughs> it very nearly accidentally happened at the start of this recording. It so, did. Um, <laughs> but we'll it. be back very, we're going to be back very soon with uh, another episode of The Coaching Clinic. Do let us know. If you have questions about anything we talked about today or anything you'd like to contribute or just a message that you'd like to leave us for the show, go to speakpipe.com forward slash the coaching clinic podcast and leave us a voicemail. We'd love to hear from you. We might even feature you on the show. Absolutely love it. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.